Good Thursday evening, everybody. Here we are once again. Sister Shana, how you doing? It's good to see you. Uh, here we are with another Thursday edition of Bible study. And uh, if I can tell, I've been on like a little diet. I hope I can tramp down a little bit for the camera. Miss Nolan, how you doing? Uh, you know, it's a beautiful rainy evening on this Thursday. I've actually been thinking about this Bible study all day. This thing, uh, it's good to see you, sis. Uh, you know, this thing might get a little bit deep. But, you know, of course, like as I say every week, I really try to seek God for what we're going to be talking about is, uh, once again, I got my soldiers in the back, young Jade and young Jamir. They're going to wave at you right quick. Uh, you see them hands up there? Young, strong, awesome man. I'm just blessed to have those guys as my nephews. And I love them. And, you know, they, it just feels like I, you know, it's like I, like I got an extra layer of protection when those fellas are in here with me. So here we go. Tonight, we're going to jump right on into it. I hope everybody's doing fine. I hope it's been a, a good week for you. One thing I've noticed about this week is that, uh, hello, Pastor, uh, is that, you know, during this time, there's a lot of things going on, whether it's financial, whether it's in the family. But, you know, I've seen, hey, Miss Sylvia, how you doing? I've seen people struggling just in their lives, in their personal lives, struggling with depression. There are people with hurting hearts. There are people that don't know which direction to go. And so I just want to keep that in mind. You know, I've been, uh, you know, Tuesday, every Tuesday throughout the month of September has been a time of uh, prayer and fasting on those Tuesdays. Uh, I, I, I want to, we want to be able to see Hear God's voice. Not just, we don't want to just guess at religion. We don't want to just guess at, at, of what God is doing in our lives. But we want to know that God is talking to us, that he's in our lives, that if we got things that need to be handled in our lives, that God is going to handle those things, that we don't have to handle them ourselves. We have to be careful that we don't get our minds caught up in the back and forth of society. And this is kind of what we're going to talk about. Not that, but. Tonight, we're going to talk about a very deep subject. If uh, you're listening and passing while you're doing other things, you might not get everything. This is a, a, a subject, and we're going to talk about something that people talk about in popular music. It's in popular society. It's dealing with the subject of Babylon. Some people say we're in the belly of the beast, and they use certain terminology like that. But the Bible talks about a place called Babylon and the Bible, but it talks about it in Revelations in a more spiritual aspect. This spiritual aspect and why it's called Babylon is something that has to do with us and our day, you and I. And it's very important that we know, what is this Bible saying to us? You know, all during this week, my mind has been, uh, the thoughts have been going through my mind. I feel like when something is on my mind a lot in the, in the weeks and days up to this Bible study, that God wants me to talk about it, even though if it may not be that easy to talk about. And uh, and now I, I believe that in the day that we're living in, we're in a very fast society. We're in a lot of phones and, you know, and things that this, this society itself, the spirit of the society is trying to strip us of our spirituality. This society is trying to strip us of our uh, godly understanding. More people know stats of basketball and football than they do about what God's word says. I can bring up the subject of Babylon and many could tell you how many points were scored last night or how many yards Cam Newton had, but they couldn't tell you what this Bible is saying about Babylon and what it means to us. And so I think it's very, very important. We must know in these last days or is a possibility we may be deceived. You know what I'm saying? And so we're going to jump into this thing, but before we do, we're going to pray uh, you know, and doing uh, this Bible study, if anyone has a question, not only that, if anyone has a prayer request, you can put it here. You can hit Abundant Living in the inbox. You can hit my personal inbox. I will pray for you. I believe if more people understood the power that we had in prayer, if more believers had a grasp on what prayer actually means, we talked about it last week, then we would never go a day without praying. Prayer moves things, especially for the dedicated, uh, the dedicated Christian. So uh, I'm going to pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. I thank you for my brothers here. I thank you for everyone that is joined in to talk about your word. God, we thank you for those hungry hearts. They'll want to understand what your word is saying. They'll want to divide your truth. They want to hear your Holy Spirit. They want to do right. And whatever situation is in their lives, Heavenly Father, I ask you right now, by the Spirit, begin to minister to their situation, both spiritually, mentally, and physically. We want to rebuke any demonic spirits, any demonic spirits that would try to attack this Bible study and these individuals that have bought themselves to listen to your word. We ask that your mind of wisdom, the spirit of wisdom and intelligence, spiritual intelligence, begin to bless and grace these people so that the things that we talk about tonight will not sound confusing, but it will be plain that a young babe could understand. We know that your spirit is going to do that even right now. We break strongholds right now from all of those that are listening. We break the strongholds of depression. We break the strongholds of any kind of sinful spirit, of any kind of fornication or homosexual spirit, of any kind of lust spirit, of any kind of lying spirit, of any kind of depression spirits, of anxiety. If anybody is feeling like they're worthless and has low self-esteem, then hug them, Heavenly Father. Let them know that they are loved. And they can do all things through Christ, the Yeshua, the Messiah, who strengthens them. And in his name we pray. Amen. All right, so I'm getting some uh, I'm getting some some things on my screen that's kind of keep popping up. So excuse me if I keep poking at the screen. I'm just pushing this button and saying, okay. So here we go. Let's get it started. Mystery Babylon the Great. The nice Bible study is going to start in Revelation chapter 17. We have a part in Revelations. There's a lot of things going on in Revelations. But then there was a verse in 17 where God addresses a woman. Zach, what's going on, brothers? Good to see you, man. So, so God addresses a woman. Now, is this an individual woman? Is this a woman that lived back in the first century AD? Or what is God saying here? Let's find that out. We're going to start. Uh, we're going to start in chapter 1. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked to me, saying to me, come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet or a red beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and seven horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gup, cup full of the abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead, this is what the name she had written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled. Uh, but the angel said to me, now why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of that woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw who was and was not and is not will ascend up out of the bottomless pit, pit and go into perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they see the beast that is and is not and yet is, here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings, five have fallen, one is, and the other one has not yet come. But when he does come, he must continue for a short space. Now, I know that initially reading this, it may sound a little confusing. What does this mean? There's a woman. She's riding a monster, a beast that is red. This beast has 10 heads and 10 horns. What does it all mean? She's sitting on many waters. Well, in my research and in my studying of Bible Prophecy. Now, first thing I'm going to go ahead and put in this disclaimer. As we as Christian individuals, it is very important, it's very imperative that we make the word of God a, state, a stable part of our lives. It will be hard for me to truly, and if you go to church every Sunday, it will be very difficult for anyone to properly assess what the preacher is saying. 
it will be possible for it will be very difficult for God to come and talk to the individual that doesn't have the written word. This word has been preserved in blood. So as you spend time with God, you know what? This, what I just read, does not sound as simple. You'll start to see patterns. You'll start to see that God talks to us in certain ways. For instance, the woman, the woman in this particular scene, and I know this because I've, because of sitting in the word, staying in the word. Now I know, look at, uh, the, the, what is the church called? The kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is called the bride of Christ. Now we know there may be some men in that thing. I'm a man, I'm, but I am a part of the bride of Christ. So the bride of Christ, he's called, or, or the kingdom of God is an unseen spiritual kingdom. The kingdom of God has come upon you. He will say, repent before the kingdom of God is near. So this is, we know that this kingdom, this called out people of God is the bride of Christ. They're referred to as a woman. Well, in the same way, an unseen spiritual kingdom that is the opposite of those that were called to God. There's an unseen spiritual kingdom that does not walk. How you doing, sister? How you doing, miss? Good to see you. There is a spiritual kingdom that does not walk in the ways and the righteousness of God. There is a kingdom that does not walk in the spirit of Christ. But that unseen kingdom has a spirit that it walks in. You've heard the language that was being referred to in Revelations. I don't know if you guys know what a harlot is. Do you know what a harlot is? I'm about to get graphic. If you got young, young children in the room, you might want to cover their ears. The Bible, very plain, a harlot is a whore. A promiscuous, filthy, a filthy female who may sell her body. Now, I'm not talking about anyone individually. This whore has a cup full of abominations. She gives this very same cup to the inhabitants of the earth who drink these, who drink these abominations. What does all of this mean? I can tell you that these things that are being written in this Bible are not there for your sheer uh, entertainment. But every jot and every tittle has a very definite meaning of what they're saying. So, so far, what have we got? We have a bride. We understand what a bride, a called out spiritual kingdom. And then we have a whore, a whore that sits on many waters. So we know we have a spiritual unseen kingdom. This is what Babylon is referred to in this sense. Now, so and all through history, you have the people of God and the people of Satan. You've had the bride, God preparing a called out people, but you've also had the counterpart. When Moses was about to be born to deliver the people, you have the whore trying to kill the ones that were born two years old and under. So there has always been this constant conflict between the bride and between the whore. Now, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Babylon. Now, where did this Babylon system first begin? Why is it called Babylon? We're going to start from there. Well, the first time we see Babylon was way back in the book of Genesis. And I'm, going to, I'm going to turn to Genesis chapter 11. Who was this individual that God, that God finds it necessary to call her out from the beginning? One of the, this is the first city that was built after the flood of Noah. Did you, you guys have, uh, happen to know that? So the first city that was built after the flood of Noah, Babylon, it was built by an individual by the name of Nimrod. And I can tell you this, uh, you know, and not to even go too deep in this, but the, 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 these people that began to repopulate the earth after God had destroyed it because of his violence, because of his sexual lust and perversions. So we have Nimrod and in Genesis chapter in Genesis chapter four. And I will say this. Uh, and I can do a different individual study on what are the things, what did they what these individuals, I believe, that were passed down from before the flood. Now, these mystery religions, these secret teachings, these secret knowledges, top knowledge that pops up in Babylon. And I'm not going to get so much into the angels that fell in Genesis chapter 6. Uh, those angels began to teach men astrology. 
They began to teach men secret dark arts. They began to teach men how to open up portals, how to communicate with spirits in different dimensions. You know, there's a lot of these things that you can find in the book of Enoch, which I believe Enoch was referred to in the Bible itself. And so here we have some of these mystery religions. God uh, that seemed you know, just as, you know, God sent the flood to destroy this race of giants. But in the conquest of Canaan, you see the the, the Zamzuman and, the, and, and uh, another name that were a race of giants that the Israelites had to destroy in their conquest of Canaan. And just as this race of giants survived the flood somehow, because the only ones that made it were, were Noah's people, but these race of giants, these, these giants were half-breeds. And you can look at this. In Genesis chapter 6, uh, the fallen angels that had children and they produced giants. But it also says that these the mothers of these half-breed giants taught men uh, secret dark arts dealing with astrology. Hello, Miss Nancy. Dealing with astrology and dealing with things like this. So just as the, the giants, the race of giants survived, some of those survived the flood, some of those secret teachings, it was those parents, these fallen angels that taught men things that they were never supposed to have knowledge of. They survived and they made their way into this teaching of Nimrod. And I can tell you almost every every mystery religion, every religion that, that, that deviates from the truth of God, when you begin to talk about Baal and Dagon and Moloch and Ishtar and all these different gods, they have survived and they have been passed down in the back rooms and they started with Babylon. And I told you we're going to get a little bit deep with this thing tonight. These things you must know because they affect you in your life, that you're living today. So, in the Tower of Babel, we have Genesis chapter 11. And I'm going to go, we're going to go here, we're going to read that. And I, and I will tell you, Nimrod, his mom was named uh, Semiramis. Supposedly, as it goes, Nimrod had a child by his mother. And this child's name was Tammuz. And they call that the unholy trinity. This is why you see in Kemet. This is why you see Horus being rebirthed. This is where you see, uh, I forgot the other dude was supposed to be born on the 25th. And they try to mix in and say that Christianity comes from this nonsense. You understand? But many of these dark religions, many of these other dark arts, the star, the crescent, the moon, Masonic, all these teachings come from the Semiramis and these things passed down from Babylon itself. So we have in Genesis chapter 4, start Genesis 11, I'm sorry, starting in verse 4. And this is the Babylonians. This is the first city of Babylon. Everybody was of one language. Everybody's passing around this secret knowledge. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of of the whole earth. Uh, but the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. Stop it right there. They said, come, let us build us a city. This city was called Babel. This is the place and the birthplace of Babylon. They said, whose city and tower... If y'all don't, don't do that, I don't mind y'all going down. I'm going to look at it. They said, let us build a tower that will reach heaven. Listen to it. And let us make a name for ourselves. This knowledge, that was this was deeper than just building some big building. But you have to understand, what does they mean? Going on, Big Brian. What did they mean when they said, let us make a name for for themselves. So you have this knowledge passed down from these fallen angels, and you have this have this 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 same secret knowledge. I mean, I'm telling you, when we're dealing with sorcery, this stuff ends up in Egypt, where we'll get to, where you have Janus and Jambres, the very same sorcerers that defied Moses. The very same sort when Moses threw his stick down, the sorcerers of Egypt threw their stick down. When Moses turned the water into blood, the sorcerers of Egypt they turned water into blood. These priests of Egypt, the Kemet, the, the Horus, the I, the Phallus, all of this was passed down from uh, those fallen, 
to Babylon and to every mystery religion that we see on this earth today, which is why the Kemet believe. That's why you see Semiramis and Nimrod, the, the, the child and so forth. This is why you see Horus and I forgot the woman's name and, uh, his, and uh, you know the, all those names. But uh, this is where you get these secret teachings and this secret knowledge that we see today. But you see them, they say we're going to make a name for themselves. That skims over, but that is the essence of every secret teaching that we see on the earth today. The make a name for ourselves is thousands, six thousands of years, oh, exactly, the same eye of Horus on the dollar because it is the same Babylon, it's the same Babylonian concept. Very good to pick out, Zach. As you see, the same eye of Horus, the pyramid, all these things. Now, this stuff is deep now. We ain't come to play tonight. And so, they make a name for ourselves. What does that mean? Um, make a name for ourselves is the same as uh, I will be my own God. I will eat of this fruit. The Satan's going to come to you and say, you're going to do what you're going to operate on what God tell you to do. You're going to operate in God. And we, as Christians, when we pray, we pray in the name of Christ. We pray by the authority, by the wishes, and by the will of Christ. But you're gonna, but those who don't, they want to build a tower to the, to the heavens. They want to be their own gods. They're gonna make a name for themselves. They want to pray in the name of God. They want to pray in the name of insert that name of whoever they are. Look, I'll break it down even further. There was a teaching that says, "Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law." This comes from a book called the Thelema. The Thelema was written by an individual. They call him the wickedest man on earth. His name is Aleister Crowley. He dedicated his life to finding and talking to demons. He had to talk to Satan. He searched all over in Egypt. This is where you, I, don't, I don't even recommend seeing a picture of him. But when you do see a picture of him, he has an Egyptian pharaoh head. They make the pyramid. He has an eye. This stuff is not nothing. These people actually talk to demonic forces. Now, he wrote this book, and the demon told him all these different ways to open up portals. Just follow, and the main way to open, he said, but you know what? If you ain't really got to kill a chicken and drink his blood to find Satan, to find Satan, all you really got to do is do what thou wilt. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Do what feels good to you. If it, Don't let nobody tell you not to follow your own dream. If you want to smack fire out of a man for not giving you correct chain back, then do it, man. If you want to have sex with animals, do what thou wilt. Now, I got extreme, but even if that do what thou wilt does not have to get that extreme. When you live your life outside of the parameters that the creator has set for us, when you say, I will be my own God, I don't want to do that. I don't want to forgive that individual. I don't want to go that particular route. I don't want to listen to what I will build my own tower up to heaven. I will do what thou wilt. Okay. Now, what is the opposite of that? Now, you fast forward to the Christ. The, he had the power of divinity in him. But on the night before he was to be crucified, he was praying. He knew he had to go through a very tough situation. But he said, I don't want to have to do this. This is going to be hard. I'm scared. I don't know what to do. I don't want to do this, my Lord, my God. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Okay? This is the opposite. Do what thou wilt. Build the tower to heaven. Make a name for yourself. The other end, not my will, but your will, my creator. I will not eat of that fruit. I will not build that tower up to heaven. I will remain in you. Now, that is a simplistic form. But out of the build your tower to heaven being passed down, you get to what we know today as Babylon. Now, every secret, every secret uh, religion and thought, and not only that, most governments, has been passed down through this Babylonian teaching. Now, Babylon is the womb for the birthplace of witchcraft. Witchcraft. But in its very essence, in its most simplistic form, witchcraft, the definition of witchcraft is the art of manipulating the mind. I was going to say something dynamic, didn't you? Witchcraft. The art of manipulating the mind. I want to manipulate somebody to get what I want. If I'm going to manipulate you through even, that, it might be through intimidation, through, uh, through coercion. Maybe, may, maybe the, you know, the, the husband doesn't, maybe the wife, how you doing, uh, cousin, you know, maybe the, you know, the, 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 the wife's mad at the husband and she said, you know, I'm going to hold a couple cookies back. 
until you get me what I want, until you buy me what I want. That is a slight of the form of witchcraft. The first, the manipulation of witchcraft is psychological manipulation. Or, you know, and not only that, but look, um, the Greek word pharmakia, where we get the word pharmacy, the manipulation of the mind through drugs, this is, where we, this is where we get our word sorcery. The word sorcery, a sorcerer, a witch actually comes from the Greek word pharmakia, the pharmacy, because it deals in manipulating the mind other than with, you know, uh, making someone do what they would not do, uh, putting someone under a spell. You can get somebody, they can be hyper, they can be tough. You give them, them them Ritalin pills or them Xanax and they... They totally con. They're different. You've manipulated that mind. You've dumbed that mind down. But not only that, this is the first, that is the pharmacia side of it. But then there is the manipulation of the mind through spiritual influence. There are people, you want to, you want, there's some people, there's shamans, some, di some different religions. If you give them a pair of old underwear or something like that, and they'll take that underwear and post some stuff on it and light a candle and feel that they're going to make somebody do something with that. What are they doing? They're opening doors and portals, man, for spirits to come and manipulate that person who they're putting it on. If that person is not covered by the blood of Christ. If they're not walking in that spirit of Christ, then that manipulation tactic will work because these spiritual essences are real. This same witchcraft infiltrates all of your music and your TV and your movies and everything. This is why even in the news, when we see someone that doesn't seem to go along the lines of compassion and empathy and understanding, they're almost like they're under a spell. You can't talk to people anymore. What is this? This is some sort of sorcery and witchcraft. And I'll tell you, most countries that we see, I mean, most even as high up in our countries, and these people that own movies and TV, and we got to be careful of what our kids are on, what they're doing, because they can, they are touched more than you know with these elements of, of witchcraft. And I'll go farther in that. Uh, uh, but it's all stemming from Babylon. I'm going to turn back to Revelations 19. We still got some good stuff to discuss. I hope you guys are with me. If you have any questions as I go along, if you're missing out something, Write these verses down, go back, and study this stuff on your own. We're talking about mystery, Babylon. She's going to be very powerful in the last days, and if we don't recognize her. Thank you, brother. And my boys in here. Okay, so Revelation 17, we're back on it. I'm going to read Revelation 17, starting in verse 9. Here is the mind which has wisdom. He's talking about the harlot. She sits on many waters. In the Bible, many waters are a sea, like the beast that comes out of a sea. And in, in prophecy, sea represents large multitudes of people, different and mixed multitudes of people. Trees represent uh, people. If you have uh, like a, a, a green natural tree, a fir tree, a fir tree, a pine, or a box, that represents the Holy Ghost field individual. Like I think this one says, and I saw the river of life and on each side of its banks were trees whose leaves were for the healing of nation. That's, that's, that's spiritual language. That's language that you begin to understand when the Holy Spirit begins to open it up because you spend time with man. You understand? And so we can read some of these things in the Bible. And they won't be so foreign to us. They won't seem like I'll get a monster and a dragon and ten heads, but you'll begin to see and hear plain. All right. 17, 9. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come. But when he does come, he will con he will continue for a short time. These seven hills are hills on which the woman sits. What are these hills? These are kings, are kingdoms. Five have fallen. One is. Five have fallen, one is, that's six, and the seventh, and there's an eighth. Who are these five kings that have fallen? As you look all in the Bible, it records these five kings. These five kings are the most powerful, or the most powerful uh, civilizations in their times. And we'll start from the one, and we'll use the word to prove that. The first one, the first king was Egypt. Egypt, who enslaved God's people. That's why God always has his eye on this, 
the, the strongest civilization at that time. He looks at that. He sees how that civilization affects his people. What is their relationship? Nine times out of ten, that strong, the strongest civilization is going to be used by the harlot as Babylon to bring some sort of oppression, oppression on the people of God. At the time of Egypt, they, they enslaved, uh, they enslaved the Israelites. Now, after Egypt had fallen, who were the next most powerful nation? The next most, most powerful nation was Assyria. That's two. So Egypt, then Assyria. Assyria uh, smashed the northern kings of Israel. And, and there hasn't been a northern kingdom of Israel to this day because of, because of Assyria. So Assyria destroys the northern kingdom of Israel. After Assyria, who do we have? We uh, know in Daniel chapter 2, 36, in Daniel chapter 2, and I could read it, you can read it on your own, but it's in Daniel chapter 2, starting in 36, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, I'll just tell you. He has a dream and he sees a statue. The statue had a gold head, shoulders of silver, a mid section of bronze, his legs were iron, and his feet were mixed with iron and clay. Man, I'm telling y'all, man, y'all better get into this word. Y'all better get serious about what God is trying to do in your lives, man. All this stuff might sound like, what are you talking about? But you ain't spending time with God, you're not going to know what God is trying to tell you. You're going to fall for the trick of Babylon. All the stuff I'm giving to you, and it's going to be our own fault. Now, these kings, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon at the time. So you have Egypt, then you have, then you have Assyria, and then Babylon was the kingdom at the time. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He asked what this dream was. Daniel comes in, man, let me tell you what you saw, brother. You saw that head, you saw that gold head, that was you. And then the next kings are kingdoms that will rule the earth after you. So you have Assyria smashed northern kingdoms. Babylon smashed Jerusalem, tore the temple down, dispersed the Israelites, okay? And then after them, you have Media Persia. Daniel actually told Babylon that you, after you, there'll be Media Persia, then there'll be Greece, and then there will be Rome. So let's count them. Five, five, five have fallen, one is. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Media Persia, and Greece. He said five have fallen. These were the civilizations in order prior to Rome. Five have fallen, one is, that's the sixth. Who was the civilization that ruled the world at the time that the book of Revelations were written? Well, friends, that was Rome. <clears throat> you can't get no more accurate than Bible prophecy playing around, not uh, still arguing over who might have wrote the Bible. Y'all, that's foolishness. You're under a spell. You're under the sorcery of Babylon. It takes diligence and finding out who God is and putting nonsense to the side. Quit getting overcome by your flesh all the time. Pray and fall down to the good Lord and say, God, I need you. I haven't walked quite right. I, I need you to show me. I, I, I thought I was right, but I wasn't. I keep getting, I keep getting sucked into things that, and God will break the spell of Babylon. Everything that we see is touch. That's why we have to be careful. Things that be so innocent. When we watch and we indulge in. Now look at the TV. This TV show is called Lucifer. And they and they and, and, and they parade all sorts of abominations. All about fornicating and adultery and cheating on your wife and selling drugs and power. And we eat that nonsense up, entertained by the sorcerer's witchcraft of Babylon itself. And then think that God is going to have that true relationship with us is nonsense. We're wrong, y'all. But it's as God talks to you, it's as God spends time in his word, that he'll give you, you know, somebody asked me at work today. And I can tell you this stuff in my personal life. Someone told me, somebody showed me yesterday, hey, man, I know a dude who tried to put some roots on his girlfriend. Oh, really? He pulls out his phone. Yeah, let me show you. He pulls out his phone and shows me a video of the dude sent him in a text. It was a little small bronze statue of the Baphomet goat, the goat of Mendez. He had, he had lit little candles around it. I said, "By the spirit, hey, first of all, stop that. T -t -t Turn it off. Put your phone back in your pocket. Don't bring that stuff out around me. And you better, and you better delete it out of your phone, sir. How you, how you doing, Maria? Maria? Delete it out of your phone. These people don't know that they're walking on the edge of demonicism." These people don't know that they're walking on the edge of perversion. You can't think the thoughts that you would want to think because you've opened yourself up the portals. That these spiritual realms are real. The Baphomet passed down 
from Babylon to do what thou wilt, to, to make a name for yourself. And we have sucked it all up. Every time your child puts on the Disney movie, it's follow your heart. Do what you want to do. Don't worry about what they're trying to tell you. Do it your own will. But we need to start, we need to put a different mentality. That's all they know. That's why when they get older, you can't tell them half nothing. Because they've been, they've been programmed. And this is what all these movies are. You got to understand that the people who even own the American place where they make movies is... Uh, is in Hollywood. They know they they they. Uh, many of them are Ashkenazi Jews. These people have studied the Kabbalistic, the Talmud that comes from Babylonian teaching, the Kabbalah that comes from Babylonian teaching. The Druids had the secret knowledge. They knew that you could only make a wand and cast spells on people with a certain type of wood. That wood was only came from the holly tree. This is why they call Hollywood Hollywood because it is a tool to cast spells and to manipulate the mind with witchcraft. Man, I hope somebody getting it. I hope somebody putting this in your put this in your register of change. It could be some information that could put you on the right track. To finally knowing God, and hearing God's voice, to breaking to breaking stronghold. Maybe that's some of us. Why some of us? I don't know. Uh, generation of curses. Why some of us have been single for so long? Why some of us have always seen by ourselves for so long? It's fine if your mind is different. We're not going to fit in with this system of Babylon if you truly know the good Lord. Uh, uh, and actually, so and I kind of got sidetracked. So we have Assyria. Then we have Babylon. Nahum, the prophet of God, in the book of Nahum, chapter three. He says concerning Nineveh, Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. He says, because of the multitude of her harlotries, of the seductive harlot, the mistress of sorceries, who sells nations through her harlotries and families through her sorceries. It sounds like Nahum is talking about Babylon. But Babylon wasn't even a superpower yet. So who was Nahum talking to? Nineveh? Or is he talking to that spirit? That Babylonian spirit that was hatched and birthed way back in the time of Nimrod, passed down. It comes from the Sumerians. Some people call that Babylon at that time when you read about the Sumerian tablets. This is where the first civilization, the cradle of civilization. So when you hear about the Sumerians, the Bible was referring to the Sumerians as Babylon. That was them. That is the first civilization. And that is where all the languages were dispersed. And that is where your secret religions come from. And this is what half the stuff that we look at is all the Avengers and all this stuff is mixed in with it. And, and you know what? And, and I'm, and I'm going I'm to say this. And if you get mad, all right, fine. Take it up with the good Lord. And if I'm wrong, I'm, but even God rest that man's soul, the Black Panther, who, who died. And, and he was a great actor. But let me tell y'all know how much witchcraft was in that movie that y'all, everybody pumps up. They pray, the, God, the, the, the God that gave him the powers was the God of the dead. And everybody's praising all this stuff, but nobody's bringing up that. They're teaching you sorcery. you pushing your kids into sorcery. Deep in, I didn't expect that, did you? Don't try to step on no toes, but I'm just saying. We got to know this stuff. But we, under spell, fall right on in the trap, fall right on in the whole flow of things. Christians, and we ain't even discussing, hey, that movie was more full of more witchcraft than, than, any, other, than any other Avenger movie, actually. Look up, look up the synopsis of those movies. Who was the God that were praying? The God of the dead? They gave them their powers? Huh? The sorcerer, but she don't know because we're under them spells. You see what I'm saying? All right. So Nahum, he saw it. He saw it. He saw it in Nineveh. He saw it a long time ago. All right. So Revelations 10. So we, so we have those five have fallen. One is recap. We're going to recapitulate what I said. The first one: Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece. Five have fallen. One is Rome, and there's one that's come. Matter of fact, I'm going to go ahead and read real quick Revelations chapter 10 and 11. I don't know what time it is. Well, thing time going by fast tonight, but I need a lot of information in a short period of time. Okay. All right. So here we go. Babylon. Who is Babylon? Is Babylon still around? She's a harlot. She rides a multitude of people. She has a cup full of abominations and fornications. 
and we go right in and commit spiritual adultery with this mistress of witchcraft. We bring her into our church assemblies. We worship Ishtar. And we do all these very things, not realizing, thinking, oh, it's no big deal. We've been doing this for 100 years, not knowing that it's keeping your mind blind. You can't see or discern the spirits that's behind it. Not knowing and understand why your kids act like that. Not knowing and understand why your relationship can't never get right. We got to break from this stuff as a church. Then we'll see the true power of the church come back to where it is supposed to be. Revelation chapter 7, uh, 17, I apologize. Uh, 9 and 10 says, here is, okay, 9, here's a mind that have wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which a woman sits. 10, there are also seven kings, five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue for a short time. 11. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to position. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not received a kingdom as of yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. So the Bible trying to tell you, man, the ten kings that you saw, the five have fallen, one is, and then there's going to be a one, to, one to come, and then the eighth is going to be the one that we call the beast. And these ten, these ten heads that you saw are ten kingdoms that will be in the earth towards the end of time. It says it right there in the word. So this beast. Uh, mark of the beast. This is when this comes all over the play. But the beast will be influenced and will be the horse, will be the system of transport, the vehicle of the vehicle of understanding for the harlot. Old and ancient as the Torah itself. Who is this harlot? What is she? Who controls her? What does she do? Is she an individual or is she some sort of unseen spirit? The mistress, the harlot. Okay? So, I, I understand this This is a deep teaching. Now, I can tell you who these ten kings are. And, they, you know, people have speculated. Like, for instance, one, uh, there are people towards the first, when the church was being persecuted greatly by the Roman Catholic Church. And I believe many of these sorcerers, many of these things have been adopted by this system. Now, today, the hall itself is a system, not just of a religious, uh, a religious background, but it is a whole system. Keep in mind, the hall, although as being religious, she also incorporates uh, uh, parameters of government, military, social networks and religion. The hall is a system. Even if you look at the book of Daniel, I believe the book of Daniel was a precursor to the things that would happen to us in the end times. You look at the Shadrach, Meshach, and the Bendigo, how they had to, when you would hear the entertainment, the sound of the sack, but sartory and harp, and when you hear that, you had to bow down and worship the image. Just like in the Revelations, we have to worship the image of the beast. I found it uncanny how they mixed this worship with the entertainment system. When you heard the music, then you bowed down. And so what we have here is Babylon. That's why they use Babylon herself. Don't you understand that there's a, there's a book that certain aspects of uh, Orthodox Jews read that you've probably never heard of. It's full of all the writings of all the rabbis and the, all the Pharisees from thousands of years. This book was birthed during the time that the Jews were captives in Babylon. And so you take Judaism and you mix it with the Kabbalah teaching and they produce a book called the Talmud. I don't know if you've ever heard of this book, but many Jews keep this book secret and they teach their own children in their own books. And it's full of Kabbalistic and Babylonian sorcery and belief and thought passed down, man, from centuries and centuries. Many of us never know because they hide this stuff in plain sight and they hide it from view. And we never know because they put the blinders over people's eyes just to keep the blind from seeing true good stuff. And I was just saying that, Jazz, as you were saying, as you was writing it. They do this to keep the blinders over, over our eyes. 
These people are more dedicated in their beliefs than most Christians are in theirs. They know their Talmud more than you know your Bible. This stuff is deep, y'all. If we're not diligent in daily prayer, we are just as much physical beings as spiritual beings. It's the time now in these last days, because if you if we do not wake up out of our slumber, the powers of Babylon before her end are only going to get stronger. The only way, that's why the Bible talks about that's going to be the mark of the beast that's going to be divvied out to those in the last days. But you can't put a mark on the people who have the seal of God. You can go back to one of our teachings dealing with the mark of the beast, and it tells you that those that have the seal of God cannot be marked with the mark of the beast. What is the seal of God? I believe the Bible makes it plain. And I go into detail in that, in that teaching. The seal of God is those who walk in the Holy Spirit, who not, who are not making their, building their tower to heaven, who are not doing their own will, but the those who say, not my will, God, every, uh, but your will be done. And they are led by the Spirit, and they walk in the Spirit. And when they pray, God hears their prayers. And if they're not sure that God's hearing their prayers, then they'll sit still. You know, these are individuals that walk in the spirit. They listen for God's word, listen for God's voice. They're not inundated. They're not overwhelmed with the filth, watching Lucifer and the pornography and the, and, 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 and the fornication and the adultery and the vulgarness and the violence that's going on in our day. They're not with this political party or that political party, but we are with the kingdom of God. It is only those individuals who won't come under the spell. Only even how I can see sometimes, and when I try to talk to some some people, they don't know what you're talking about. I sound foolish to them. Fine. I'll be that. But I know what my God has shown me by standing in this word. Nobody's gonna understand you because most people don't be in their word like that. It's foolishness to them. Why they harp on the things of the world and these things that give them that brief fleeting entertainment. But leaves them empty inside. Somebody asked me this today, man, why, what, what are you on, man? What drug are you on, boy? You being here just happy and bouncing around? I said, I'm on no drug. I used to be. Don't get, don't get it twisted. But I'm on no drug. I am, I, I am on the, I, I am, I'm high off the spirit of life. What you mean spirit of life? I said, man, that's what God give me. He says, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in God. I'm an atheist. That's what he said. Fine, you can be an atheist, but look at you moping around here with your lip poked out 10 feet. You don't understand the spirit of life because I don't live by the spirit of this world. You know, I've been there. I've done that. I've had a very difficult life. I've done my dirt and I've fallen, but I've then I've gotten back up. I understand even in my track record, if somebody said, man, I don't want to listen to old James. I know James when he was a youngster, but I bought a while. He's been in it, he's been out of it, but still, I know that God has been effective in my life mightily. And I'm trying to see more. I'm not content. You know, I was thinking today on the sin of contentment that plagues the church, that plagues those people who call themselves children of God. The sin of contentment. I'm fine. God's going, God, I'm fine where I am. But you're not hungering and thirsting for more. Listen, until you're raising the dead. I want to be able to walk in the perfection that is my God. We ain't gonna never be perfect. Whatever, get over here with that. Who told you that? Man, who, I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe not. But I'm going to get it. I'm gonna reach for it. I might be wrong or something. I'm not gonna be content. Then God show me, boy, you wasn't quite right. I, it's not no burden to me. I love it. I need that. Give me more of that. I got to find out what God's will is for my life. If you don't want to, fine. I love you. High five. I'll catch you on the flip side. But I'm going forward in this, and I'm trying to tell you, unless you, have you raised the dead yet? Have you resisted unto blood? Has an angel came and spoke to you? Like, you know, have you been caught up to the third heaven? If not, you need to keep on going. You need to stop being content with what you're doing. Because we all have a mandate on this earth, and the time, the church has, the church has been dormant for too long. The church has been dormant and dead for too long. It is time for people to see God in action, not in word. But it's time for God to be seen in action, people. And now, so now to wrap this thing up, I'm going to read um, Revelations 18, just briefly, talking about the destruction of Babylon. Amen. I tell you, it's been a fun, this has been a fun Bible study. God, going deep with God. God, y'all, we different people, man. We are different people. We don't think and move like the world think and move, you know? 
Okay. All right. Starting in verse one. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with, with his glory. And he cried mildly with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of her wrath and of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become have become uh, rich through the abundance uh, of her luxuries. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come, come out of her, my people. Y'all listen to it now. Verse 4, Revelation 18, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, lest you receive her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Render her just as she rendered to you, and repay to her double according to her works. And the cup, and the cup which she has mixed, mixed double for her, or she gonna get it, y'all. And in the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, and the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen, and am no widow, and will see no sorrow. Therefore her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning, famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judges her. The kings of the earth who committed fornication and live luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her. When they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city. For in one hour her judgment has come, and the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her. For no one buys their merchandise anymore, merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple silk and scarlet, every kind of wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious bronze and wood and marble and cinnamon and incense and fragrant oil and frankincense, wine and oil and fine flour, wheat, cattle and sheep, Horses and chariots and bodies and souls and the souls of men. And I and I'll stop that thing right there. We got to come out from this Babylonian system. We have to have the discernment to see what is Babylon and what is not. Stop these sorcery, the sorceries of her from manipulating our mind. She sells she's she's getting rich off cinnamon and incense and souls. And souls of men. You know, if we look up that word, we can get all that word that God has for us. We can have a perfect understanding of God's will for our life. You understand? We can walk in true holiness. We can walk hand in hand with God. We can change the environment in which we live in. There may be some persecution, but we will ultimately win whatever battle. We put our hands to. All right. So, and that's pretty much it. And if anybody has any uh, prayer requests, remember we're doing uh, fasting and praying every two, well, the rest of the Tuesdays for the remain the remainder of September, uh, every second Friday at Abundant Living Christian Ministries, we have uh, prayer. Also, if anyone would like to come fellowship with us, of course, we're socially distancing. I'm available for a hug. If you get there, you want to. I hug you. I'm thinking I'm fine. You know, if you if you want to, but you know, but we are socially distant, we're sanitizing, but we praising the good Lord at Abundant Living Christian Ministries on Sunday, and you can come right back here for next Thursday. And when next Thursday, we're gonna be closer to the good Lord. I'm gonna have a little bit more revelation from him. You know, so keep me in your prayers, guys. I pray for y'all, love and blessings to y'all, and we'll see y'all next Thursday. God bless you.